Peace of the Lord be with you. You may be seated. I'll be honest, I was excited to wake up today and turn the page on the calendar, step into March. I don't know if anyone's like me, but February is a tough month. It feels like Groundhog's Day. It's the, do- it's the bone in the mouth of the dog that won't let go. Every day just feels so kind of unrelenting. Not that I'm somebody who wishes my days away or doesn't want to fully live in the present. I just, I- I'm a little bit affected by the seasonal affective disorder, not seeing the sun. Every day, the routine of the, the jacket, the scarf, the gloves, the cap, the snow shoveling, the snow shoveling. I find sometimes in February that I get locked, not so much in a month, but in a mood. February isn't just a calendar, uh, days on a month on the calendar. Sometimes it's, it's the mood we get locked into, in kind of our own little cul-de-sac. And sometimes in that, I, I need help to get myself out of it. I find myself doing something kind of funny. I find myself singing out loud. Do you ever do that? you ever just... Sing, because you need to get out of not only the month, but a mood. I sing songs like this. Maybe you know, and if you do, sing along. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Or maybe I, I, I sing... A song like this that I learned a long time ago as a kid. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness <laughs> and all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have such nice voices. Sometimes I just sing because it helps me get out of myself and to remember a reality that's framing reality. That's partly what we're doing here, isn't it? We're not just marking our days, but we're trying to participate into something large. This semester, we've been asking ourselves a fundamental question. What time is it? And the answer to that question isn't a month on the calendar. It's not about chronos time. It's about kairos time, something pregnant, something about to happen. And our answer is this. What time is it? It's time to go be a witness, inspired by Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What time is it right now is that the Holy Spirit is being poured out so that you and I might be a witness in the world. That you and I might be a witness here in the soil of hope. The Holy Spirit is still being sent by Jesus the Son, by the authority of the Father, so that you and I might bear witness to something true. But it's not easy to be a witness. Nothing easy about it. We don't just wake up and know how to be a witness, and so we need help. And one of the great things is that God has given us the scriptures, and the scriptures are our guide. The scriptures are our compass. When we read the scriptures, particularly the book of Acts, it's giving us lessons again and again about what it means to be a witness. And so tonight, I want to invite you to chapter 16 of the book of Acts. We're going to be beginning in verse 16. And we're going to hear one of the most famous stories in all of this letter. Paul and Silas in in prison. Hear the word of the Lord as it comes to us from the book that we love, a bush that burns and is never consumed. One day, as we were going along, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and who brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune-telling. While 
she followed Paul and uh, she would cry out, these men are slaves of the Most High God and they proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for days. But Paul, who was greatly annoyed, said to her, said to the Spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And the Spirit came out of her that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, and they dragged them to the marketplace before the authorities. When they brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews, and they are advocating customs that are not lawful for Romans to adopt or observe. And the crowd that was around them, they also attacked them. And the magistrates stripped them of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. And after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and ordered the jailer to hold them securely. Now on these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in stocks. It was about midnight, and Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately the doors were wide open and everyone's chains were unfastened. And when the jailer woke up and saw that the doors to the jail were wide open, he drew out a sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted out in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer, the jailer went and got some light and hurried in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who was in his house. And that very hour he took them and he washed their wounds and he and his entire family were baptized without delay. And then he brought them into his house and he set food before them and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. It's an amazing story. And when I hear it, there are so many things that I would love to dive into. As I think about what does it mean, what does it look like to be a witness, I think that there are a few things that poke at me, a few things that I, I like to observe. There, it teaches me that if I'm going to be a witness, there are certain things I need to expect. If I'm going to be a witness, there are a few habits I need to do. And if I'm going to be a witness, there's a miracle I need to celebrate. It's time to be a witness. But to be a witness, there's something we need to expect, something that will happen. If we take the name of Jesus seriously, the name of Jesus seriously in the sense that the Bible takes Jesus' name, Jesus who is the word made flesh, Jesus who is the lion who becomes the lamb, Jesus who is the sacrifice that takes away the sin of the world, Jesus who is the one who conquers death by walking out of the darkness of the tomb and into the bright, fresh light of a new epoch, a new era, the same Jesus that is pouring out his, his Holy Spirit upon us right now. If I take that Jesus seriously, there's something we need to expect that will happen. Jesus is always, always going to disrupt the status quo. Jesus is always going to meddle and disrupt cultural customs and norms. Because our culture and our customs, no matter how much we might hold to them as dear, are all part of a broken world, broken lives. Things are not the way that they're supposed to be. And we see that here in this story. 
The gospel is always going to disrupt the status quo. Paul and Silas and Luke, the author, they get up in the morning and they go to the place of prayer. It's a normal day. They wash their face. They put on their clothes. They head out the door. And while they're on the way, they meet a girl, a slave girl, owned by someone else. And she has a spirit of divination, meaning she has the ability to see things other people don't see. And her owners are taking advantage of her, using her, exploiting her so that they can make some money. But this spirit, this demon actually within her, immediately recognizes who they are and proclaims to everyone, these are slaves of the Most High God and they proclaim to you a way of salvation. Now isn't it interesting that the slave girl recognizes these men as slaves of God? The spirit within her recognizes the truth and proclaims it for everyone to hear. She's telling the truth. And she's telling it day after day after day. As long as wherever they go, this girl apparently is with them and proclaiming, these men are the slaves of the Most High God, and they proclaim to you a way of salvation. Now, you would think that Paul would be excited about this, but he got greatly annoyed. And so he turned to her and said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. Now, I would like to think that Paul was had enough awareness to do this out of a sense of social justice, out of a sense of, uh, of saying this is wrong that you own this girl. But the scriptures don't say that. Paul did not do that. He was just annoyed. He was just bothered. He actually just wanted her to be quiet. But whatever reason Paul had in mind, God had a different reason in mind. Because when you invoke the name of Jesus, things get disruptive. It challenges the status quo. And immediately, that spirit left the girl. And her owners, you would think that they would be happy. This, this, this young girl is healed of an affliction. You would think that the whole community would come around and say, what an amazing miracle this is that Paul has saved this girl. But no, what happens? They get mad because they can't make money off her anymore. The owners realize that their profit margins are going to go down, and nothing makes people more anxious, more angry, more, more just upset than when you impact their pocketbook. Nothing is more threatening to our cultural norms and customs than our economics. But Jesus will disrupt our economics. Jesus will disrupt those systems and um, norms and cultural customs that exploit other people. When the spirit leaves the girl, her owners are angry and they seize Paul and Silas. They drag them before the authorities and the magistrates. And they say, these men are advocating customs that we as Romans cannot adopt or observe. And so the magistrates, they don't care about Paul and Silas. They care about people making money. And so they have them stripped. And they order them to be beaten with rods. It's interesting that the next, it says, after they were flogged. Beaten with rods to the point that they were flogged means that that would have drawn blood. They would have been severely, severely harmed. After they were severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. Their feet were fashioned in stocks. They were put in the innermost cell, so it would have been completely dark. They couldn't move. Their feet, sitting on the ground probably, cold and dark, bleeding. What's interesting to me about this is that when we invoke the name of Jesus and we command spirits to leave, it disrupts the status quo, and the status quo doesn't like it. It's just something we should expect. We shouldn't be surprised when it happens. And there are a lot of things today we need to say in the name of Jesus, you need to come out. There's a lot of spirits that we just need to take away and disrupt our system. Even now, we as Christians aren't very good. I'm not very good 
about discerning some of the ways that my own culture and norms can get in the way of people really being free. And one of the things I'm, I'm, all, I'm so proud of this week, Gra- uh, a, a Hope College alum, Grace uh, Tyson, sponsored this whole Breaking the Chains week, a whole week dedicated to exploring and educating our community about sex trafficking and labor trafficking, about people using people, exploiting them so that they can make money. Here's a Hope College graduate that just a little while ago was sitting like right over there, using her time and her skills to command others in the name of Jesus to come out, to command a spirit that's evil to come out. I think that's beautiful, and I think that's what witnesses do, but I also know that when you do that, others don't like it. There's a reason why today there's as much slavery in America and around the world as there ever has been, because people make money off of it. And we as Christians need not to be addicted so much to money as we need to be addicted to the kingdom of God and his vision for all people. But when we do that, we need to be prepared and expect that others won't like it. That's that's the first thing I think witnesses should pay attention to. And if we want to go out and to be a witness, there are some habits, I think, that will help us along the way. Paul and Silas are taken and they're beaten. They were just going on the way to prayer. And while on the way they do something that disrupts the status quo. The status quo doesn't like them and throws them into prison unfairly, unjustly. They shouldn't be in prison. They should have a parade after them. But there they are, bleeding in the dark. And what do they do? About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. How would you respond if somebody dragged you in front of the authorities, told some half-truths, and those authorities stripped you, beat you with rods to the point that you are flogged and you're bleeding and then threw you into a dark prison and fastened your feet into stocks? I don't know about you, but I'd be feeling a little sorry for myself. A little... This is not the way things are supposed to be. I'd be plotting my revenge. I'd be plotting my defense. I'd be angry. But how do Paul and Silas respond? They pray. And they sing. In the deep darkness, they didn't allow their circumstances to define their reality. They allowed their reality to define their circumstances. And their reality is this. Though they are in prison, they are already free. And they knew that there are people around them in prison who need to be free. And so they prayed. They prayed fervently. That's what Paul always recommends. In Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7, he says this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The man who wrote that is the same man in prison, in the stocks, bleeding in the dark, praying and singing hymns to God, because he knows the truth that the Lord is near And he knows that the most powerful way to fight the darkness is to rejoice in the Lord and to rejoice always. In the direst circumstances, Paul has developed the habit as a witness to pray and to sing. What might it have been like to have been around that prison and to hear Paul and Silas, though they have just been so mistreated, they're incarcerated, They're constrained to hear these brothers joyfully praying, interceding, and to sing. I wonder what songs they sang. I wonder if they sang, Create in me a clean heart, 
Oh, God. Or, or maybe they sang, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Alleluia, alleluia. I bet whatever they sang, it was that beautiful. They sang because they knew that the best way to pull them out of prison was to remind themselves and to others around them of the truth that there, that there is a kingdom that we can seek, that our circumstances, no matter how dire they are, do not define us. Our identity in Christ defines us. And that is something I think we need to practice. Isn't it interesting, it says, about midnight they were praying and they were singing hymns to God, and then the scriptures emphasize the fact that, and the other prisoners were listening to them. They never missed an opportunity to witness. Others need to hear those songs. Others need to hear our prayers. I believe that one of the most powerful witnesses we get to do here is just what we're doing here, coming together to sing. I'm often sometimes stopped by people in the community down on 8th Street, I'm in a store, and they come up and like, hey, you're that guy, you're that guy at Hope, right, that, by the chapel. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, the, yeah, I'm that guy. Um, I'm one of those guys, one of those people. And they say, you know, I just want you to know, like, sometimes we walk through campus, and we just love to hear the music and the singing of the students. You don't even know that others are listening when we sing. I believe that God gave us voices, not just so that we can communicate, but that from the very best gift we could use to give glory back to God, our singing is a kind of witness. And that's one of the habits we need to do. Every single day, we need to get up and we need to pray and we need to sing because we don't know who else is listening around us. I believe the jailer was listening. What must it have been like for the jailer to experience these men after they were beaten and bruised and then he had to be the one to fasten their feet in the stocks? He saw what their condition was. He knew what it was like when he shut the door and all the light went away and they just sat in darkness. For him to hear them praying and singing hymns to God must have had a profound impact. So much so that it set up a major miracle that we need to celebrate. Witnesses are people that should expect that the gospel should challenge the status quo. We should develop the habits of singing and prayer, but we should also, also celebrate the miracle that God has done and continues to do. And the miracle in this story isn't necessarily what we think. We might read that story and we might think that the miracle is the earthquake, that shakes the foundations of the prison, or that this earthquake somehow jarred the doors to be wide open, or that somehow this earthquake allowed the chains to be unfastened. We might think that's the miracle, but that's not the real miracle. The real miracle in this story, I think, is that the jailer's life was fundamentally changed by experiencing the grace of God. Sometimes when we think of miracle, we think of those sensational activities. But more often than not, it is somebody who comes to believe that Jesus is Lord and experiences salvation. I can't help but think that the jailer, though he had locked away Paul and Silas, wasn't himself in some kind of prison and had to feel the kind of envy that these men had by being able to pray and to sing freely. When the doors were opened, he, he awoke after the earthquake. Somehow he slept through this earthquake. I think that's odd. 
he woke up and he saw that the prison doors were wide open. And what does he do? He draws his sword and he's about to kill himself because he thinks that these prisoners has, have escaped. Now, this is an honor-shame culture. He had been ordered by the magistrates to hold these prisoners securely. And he woke up, and the gates are gone. He's assuming that they're gone. He's failed. He's not lived up to their expectations or his own. And what does he do? He wants to kill himself. I think that one of the things that kills more people than war or disease, or anything else, is shame. Because shame can kill us while we're still alive. Here's a man who's so proud. Here's a man who's so committed to his own kind of prestige that when that prestige is challenged or he doesn't live up to it, he'd rather die than live with the shame. Have you ever not lived up to your own expectations? Maybe you haven't drawn a sword. Maybe you have. But at the very least, you want to hide. It's the oldest story in the book we love, the first sin. Adam and Eve do not live up to God's expectations. And what do they do? They hide. This is a form of hiding. Maybe you've been caught in something you didn't think you'd ever be caught in or struggling with some addiction you didn't think you'd ever be struggling in, but there you are. Or maybe you got involved more physically than you ever thought you would and you feel deep down in your gut, if anyone found out about this, if anyone really, really knew, the miracle in this story, is that the grace of God overcomes all the shame. It does. That's the miracle. Every single day, that grace overcomes the shame that we bear. In this particular story, the jailer wakes up and realizes that Paul and Silas have not escaped They have stayed right there even though they could flee. Because I think Paul and Silas understood that they needed to witness to a man who was in prison even though he was free. Even though he was free and could walk about, the jailer was trapped in his own prison of pride, his own lockdown of shame. And if they fleed, he would rather die than live. And so they stay. He rushes in, he checks them out, he brings them outside, and he's so overwhelmed, he asks them this question, what must I do to be saved? And they say, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And then they share the word of the Lord with him and his household. They share the word of the Lord. What must it have been to hear that testimony on their lips? The word of the Lord about Jesus. Jesus, who is the lion of who became the lamb to take away the sin of the world. Jesus, who was at the foundation at the very beginning when the spirit hovered over the chaos, Jesus was there. When Adam and Eve fled, Jesus was there. Jesus is eternal. Jesus has always been there, begotten of the Father. Jesus is God's eternal promise to put the world to rights. He came in the flesh, took the time to put on flesh and walk among us to do what we could not do for ourselves. What would they have heard that word, he and his family, about Jesus, that Jesus is the key that unlocks us from the prison of our own pride, of our own self, so that we can run free and wild in the wide open country of salvation. They heard the word and immediately they were baptized. And that very hour, the jailer took them out and he washed their wounds. He took them home and he put food before them. See, the miracle is a man's life was fundamentally changed and transformed. They, he believes unto Jesus and he is saved. He is saved. But that believing isn't just a cognitive, uh, a cognitive thing. His habits changed. 
His lifestyle changed. He was still under orders to keep these men in prison, but he took them out of prison, disrupting the social order and the status quo. And he cleaned off their wounds, and he fed them. And he and his entire family celebrated that he was a believer in God. That's the miracle that witness, witnesses celebrate. He and his entire family. When somebody comes to believe, it's never a private thing. It impacts all the relationships around us. This man who was so proud, so diligent about his duty, I wonder what kind of father he was to his kids. They rejoiced when he became a believer in God. They rejoiced when their father, her husband, the son, became a believer in God because grace transforms us into being new people. The old is gone and the new has come. That's what witnesses always are pointing to. That's the miracle we get to celebrate in. And it not only happened in a story of Acts, it continues to happen, even today. I just got done reading this book, Unbroken. Has anyone read this? So I didn't see the movie. The movie just came out, but I heard it wasn't very good because they missed some of the fundamental point. Louis Zamburn, Zam, Zam, Z. He was a prisoner of war in World War II, survived this tragic plane crash and survived at sea for over 40 days while sharks were trying to bite him, people shooting at him. He survives all of that and then is taken into a concentration or a prison camp, a prisoner of war camp, and endures over two years of just the most cruel treatment you can imagine. He survives all of that and comes home, and you would think that he's free. He's free from prison. But he gets home and he finds out he's already in a new kind of prison, the prison that comes with so much anger and hate and shame about his experience that he just can't let that go. And it, he falls into alcoholism. He gets in routine fights. He's alienating his wife. He's about ready to get divorced and lose his kids and lose his friends. Even though he has endured all the hardship in his freedom, he's not free, he's in prison. But he hears the gospel. I mean, really hears it. Not a playtime religion thing, not just the kind of cultural duty thing. But he experiences and encounters the living God. And it changes him. It allows him to put away the shame and the anger and allows him to practice forgiveness. And it changes him and his entire family. He writes a letter to his captor, the one who tortured him. And he writes this to, to his captor. As a result of my prisoner of war experience under your unwarranted and unreasonable punishment, my post-war life became a nightmare. It was not so much due to pain and suffering as it was the tension of stress and humiliation that caused me to hate with a vengeance. Under your discipline, my rights, not only as a prisoner of war, but also as a human being, were stripped from me. It was a struggle to maintain enough dignity and hope to live until the war's end. The post-war nightmares caused my life to crumble, but thanks to a confirmation with God through the evangelist Billy Graham, I committed my life to Christ, and love replaced the hate I had for you. Christ said, forgive your enemies and pray for them, and pray for them. As you probably know, I returned to Japan in 1952 and was graciously allowed to dress all the Japanese war criminals at Sugama Prison. I asked then about you and was told that you had probably committed suicide, which I was sad to hear. At that moment, like the others, I also forgave you and now would hope that you would also become a Christian. He writes a letter to someone who had put him in prison. He writes a letter to somebody he just hated. And by encountering the living God, he was able to forgive. Friends, that's the miracle. 
And it's not an easy thing to do. But we need to be a people who participate in that miracle and celebrate it every day by forgiving ourselves. By being people who trust this grace that will hold us no matter what because this is the grace that will overcome all the shame, all the fear, all the hurt in our lives. But we do need to believe. Believe in the name of Jesus. And if you do, you will be saved. You will enter that wide open country of salvation. You will run and be free. You will experience the deepest joys and the brightest colors. You will experience real community and real intimacy. What we were made for. The Christian life is an invitation for what God has intended to be good. Whole, healthy, joyful relationships restored. The jailer experienced that, and that is the miracle. And that miracle is still going on because Jesus is still pouring out his spirit. Jesus is still coming here to feed us, to nurture us, and to give us a grace that overcomes all the doubt and all the darkness we might endure. To that end, friends, would you join with me as we come to Jesus' table to feed us to be witnesses?